welcome to the Spinal Cord Injury Forum. My name is Jeannie Hoffman and I'm a clinical psychologist here in the Department of Rehabilitation Medicine and the director of the Northwest Regional Spinal Cord Injury System at the University of Washington. We welcome you tonight to our first uh, online forum uh, on Zoom and we're pleased to welcome Dr. Nicholas Debye, who is the current Spinal Cord Injury Fellow at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System. He's gonna be presenting tonight on cardiometabolic disease, also known as heart, weight, and nutritional diseases, and their relevance to the spinal cord injury community. So I'll turn things over to you, Dr. Debye. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hoffman. And thank you to the SCI Forum for inviting me here today to speak. So today we're gonna to review um, cardiometabolic disease and specifically how this um, impacts individuals with uh, spinal cord injuries. So what we'll do is we'll do an introduction to the topic itself, define some specific terms that we need to know regarding cardiometabolic disease, identify risks and specific risks for individuals with spinal cord injuries, how do we diagnose it, and some, some ideas of how, what we can do regarding management. First thing we'll do an introduction is what I want to make note of is that the Consortium for Spinal Cord uh, Medicine and the Paralyzed Veterans of America have put together clinical practice guidelines regarding the identification and management of cardiometabolic risk following a spinal cord injury. And these are relatively recently published. You can get a copy of this guideline if you want it for yourself at the pva.org and you can just, or you can just type in Google, type in PVA guidelines and you'll get a link on directly to it. Um, just want to make note that part of the steering committee for the consortium consists of faculty from the University of Washington. So cardiometabolic disease, I'll also refer to it as CMD. I have here four, um, four groups. Cardiometabolic disease is not really just one thing, but it's a situation in which you have multiple kind of disease processes going on. And these four major categories one is obesity, where we think of being overweight. Hyperglycemia, known as high blood sugar. Dyslipidemia, which really we can think of as high cholesterol, but I'll get into that more later. Hypertension, or really just high blood pressure. And don't worry about knowing what each of these are right now. We're gonna to continue to come, re just review these over multiple times, but I just wanna to introduce to you this concept of what CMD is consistent of. So why is it important? And we think of cardiometabolic disease as a silent killer. And individuals with SCI have at least or even a greater risk of having CMD compared to an individual that doesn't have a spinal cord injury. And the prevalence in the US, individuals without a spinal cord injury, prevalence is about 34%. But when we look at individuals with an SCI, the range can be from 31 to 72%. And overall, I mean, this is important because having CMD increases your probability of developing heart disease and diabetes. And so I thought I'd take this time right now just to understand when we talk about heart disease, just make sure we're all on the same page and understand what we're talking about. So heart disease in itself, really, we're talking about problems with the heart, but also the blood vessels. And this diagram that I have here is basically a blood vessel that's kind of cut in cross section. And we see on the right side, we see a normal vessel. And then in the middle, we see a vessel that's having what we call arterial sclerosis. And what this refers to is, the arterial just refers to it being an artery, and sclerosis refers to a thickening of the wall in the artery. And what happens is, in individuals, for example, who have high blood pressure, the walls of the artery can thicken and limit the amount of blood that actually can travel to the organs in your body. And in the other process, which we call atherosclerosis, which you may have heard about, it's really this buildup of cholesterol and plaque in the wall of the blood vessel, which again will limit blood flow to the heart or to the organ. And so they're really two in the same thing in regards to the ultimate impact of this is that you're having some injury that's done to the artery and it's limiting the amount of blood that could travel to the heart, could travel to the brain or different organs in your body. And what's the kind of the consequence of that? Well, one is an individual can have a heart attack. So this diagram right here is a diagram of a heart and the blood vessels that feed the heart itself are called coronary arteries. And this is a common place where you can have that atherosclerosis process occur. Where here in section number one, you can see a nice open vessel, but with time you'll get a buildup of this cholesterol product, which we call a plaque in the wall of the 
coronary artery, ultimately limiting the amount of blood flow to your heart. And in effect, that can result in a heart attack. We also think about strokes happening. So you can get, in this picture where we're seeing here, we're looking at one of the blood vessels that, which is called the carotid artery that provides blood to the brain. And you can have that same atherosclerosis process occurring in that artery. And what can happen is you can cut off blood flow directly to the brain, which can lead into a stroke, which we call an ischemic stroke, referring to no blood flow going to that area. Or even part of that plaque, part of it can break off and then also cut, block off circulation to the brain. You can also end up just having heart failure in itself. I mean, over time, you imagine the heart will be working a lot harder from, that, from those diseased arteries, and then the heart itself will not function as well. You can also get abnormal rhythms in the heart, which we call arrhythmias. A common one that you may be familiar with is um, atrial fibrillation, or known as AFib. And what that means is one of the chambers in the heart that we call the, the atria, it basically doesn't pump nice and, nice and smoothly. Instead, it pumps irregularly. And what can happen is you can develop a clot in that, in that part of the heart, and then part of that clot can break off, and that can lead to a stroke. So there's these multiple conditions that we talked about that can, uh, can happen, that can occur in someone um, from this disease process. But I don't want you to also think that it just occurs in the heart, but it can also occur like in the peripheral vascular, like for example, in blood vessels in the legs, and that can create peripheral vascular disease. So again, here's our um, components of, of cardiometabolic disease. We're looking at being overweight, having high blood sugar, these abnormal cholesterol levels in your blood, and high blood pressure. And so factors that increase your risk of cardiometabolic disease. Well, depending on when, what age you're at when you had the spinal cord injury, um, how long you've been injured for, how healthy you were before the injury, um, family history and ethnicity can all play a factor in your risk of having cardiometabolic disease. And some things that are specific to individual spinal cord injury are that having a sedentary lifestyle, sitting more and not getting enough exercise, um, eating more calories than you burn, causing you to gain weight, and things known as inflammatory proteins being elevated. And I'm gonna go get into this in more detail, but I don't wanna make it too complicated for you, but just think that there's proteins in our body that are signs of, that implicate signs of inflammation. And a, a very common one is known as C-reactive protein. And it's known that an individual spinal cord injury seem to have an elevated C-reactive protein level. And that in itself is known to be a risk factor for cardiometabolic disease. And I'll talk about this a little bit more later. And so again, here's that, that diagram, these four components. And in here, I make it look like it seems that each of these components are not really related to each other. And the reality is they are. One doesn't really work without the other. Obesity can lead to having high blood sugar, which can lead to high blood pressure, which can lead to abnormal um, cholesterol levels in your body. So they're not separate entities. Instead, each of these components are related to each other. And then as we go through the presentation, we'll see more of how that works. So the question is, if a seven-year-old individual, will they be more at risk if they were injured at 60 versus saying they were injured maybe in their 20s? And what I would say is that an individual that's injured later in life uh, probably would be at lesser risk than someone who was injured when they were younger. Because if, you th if that, and, but if you assume that that individual who got injured in their 60s, say lived, had a healthy diet, exercised, um, and kind of had good lifestyle choices, they don't have that 40 year gap of where they, compared to like a 20 year old person who wasn't able to do that. So getting, um, getting injured at a, earlier in life will put you at a higher risk of having CMD. Because of the spinal cord injury and some of the factors that we're gonna get into and how they affect you. So when we talk about obesity, we're really talking about excessive fat but not just excessive fat anywhere in the body. It's really what we call central obesity, obesity in the abdominal area. And that's what this diagram is um, depicting. And we know that when you have uh, what we call the central obesity or obesity in the abdominal area, these individuals typically are at risk of developing those components of CMD, of insulin resistance, which can lead to diabetes, um, abnormal cholesterol levels in the blood, 
high blood pressure, and ultimately to cardiovascular disease, those kind of diseases that I talked about earlier. And the thing that a lot of people don't appreciate is that fat itself is not a benign tissue. Fat is an endocrine organ, very active. It produces lots of those, for example, the inflammatory um, protein that I mentioned, um, CRP. It produces that. It's known that individuals who are of heavier weight end up having higher levels of that inflammatory product. So that's the point I wanted to stress here, that to know that fat itself is very active and it's not benign. So insulin resistance. Sorry, I apologize that this is a pretty wordy slide. But I think in order to understand insulin resistance, we need to do a little bit of review of what is insulin. So insulin itself is a hormone that's made from the pancreas. What insulin does, it helps remove sugar that's in the blood and helps put them into our organs. It's what's kind of regulating what your blood sugar level is at. And so if you, when you eat a meal and your body processes that meal, your blood sugar levels will go up. And so then your pancreas will then make insulin to take that sugar out of the blood and put it into your organs. In going with that, so then how is insulin related to um, diabetes? And so there are two types of diabetes that we talk about. One is type 1 diabetes. And these are individuals for some reason or another, they're just their body, their pancreas doesn't make any insulin. The more common one that we're familiar with is um, type 2 diabetes. And so in these individuals, for most of their life, they're able to make insulin. But at some point, either their pancreas stops making the insulin or their body just doesn't respond to um, the insulin as well as it did before. So that's when we're talking about insulin resistance, that your body itself is not really responding as well to insulin itself. And the result of that is that you end up having high levels of sugar in your blood. And so in summary then, really we're saying that insulin resistance itself leads to failure of the body to respond to insulin, which leads to high blood sugar, which ultimately leads to type 2 diabetes. And I wrote in here where I wrote high blood sugar, I put in parentheses, glucose. So when you go to the doctor and they tell you what your blood glucose level is, they're really just telling you what your blood sugar level is. And so just to note that there is evidence that suggests that persons with SCI have a higher prevalence of diabetes than individuals without an SCI. So as I mentioned, insulin resistance can lead to diabetes. And there's significant complications to that. One is being cardiovascular disease. Um, you can have kidney disease. You can have tingling and numbness or pain in your hands and your feet. And we call that a, a neuropathy. Um, you can have vision problems, and you can be prone to developing skin wounds. When your blood sugar levels are really high, it's hard for your body to heal those wounds, so you can suffer from significant wounds due to diabetes. And the risk of insulin resistance and diabetes in persons following SCI is at least as great as, you know, persons without. Other risks are that being of age 45 or older, Blacks, Hispanics, and Latino, American Indians, Asian Americans, and Pacific Islanders seem to be at higher risk. Having a parent, brother, or sister with diabetes puts you at risk. Physical inactivity, obesity, hypertension, and dyslipidemia, which is abnormal lipid values, I mean cholesterol levels. And so again, you can see those components of CMD keep reappearing in each of these conditions. So dyslipidemia, so dys in itself just means bad. Lipid is really referring to a fat compound and emia is referring to something in the blood. So what we're really talking about it is bad kind of fat in the blood. And most people are pretty familiar with this topic. And so in the case of abnormal levels, what we're talking about is one, we're talking about what we call lipoprotein cholesterols, which really is just your good cholesterol and your bad cholesterol. And we know the good cholesterol is your HDL, and then the bad cholesterol is known as LDL. And if, for anyone who's had a lipid panel done, you'll be familiar with um, seeing these on the lab results. Triglycerides um, is really just fat in the blood. And cholesterol itself is just referring to cholesterol. But there's a specific ratio that we look at when we talk about this lipidemia specifically. And in the case of cardiometabolic disease, when we refer to this lipidemia, what we're saying is we have low good cholesterol and we have a lot in high triglycerides or high fat. So again, that ratio we're looking at is low good cholesterol, or low HDL, and high fat, or high triglycerides. 
and that's, that is the kind of the ratio that is known to cause significant cardiovascular disease. And unfortunately, individuals with spinal cord injury typically have low good cholesterol and high triglycerides. And so, and this combination itself is really what leads to the heart and vascular disease that is, that is commonly seen. And hypertension, well, hypertension is high blood pressure. And so, there are risk factors that increase your chances of developing high blood pressure, some of which you can control, and there's some that you just can't control. You know, regarding what factors you can control is limiting smoking or exposure to secondhand smoke, decrease your chances of getting diabetes, being obese or overweight, high cholesterol, unhealthy diet, physical inactivity. And, and as you can tell that some of these, what we call these modifiable risks or risks that you can change are actually huge challenges for individuals with spinal cord injury, which is what's putting them at risk of having the high blood pressure from the beginning. So factors that you, we just can't change, um, you know, family history of high blood pressure, race or ethnicity, African Americans typically have a higher prevalence of high blood pressure, increasing age, gender is typically more common in males and females, having kidney disease, obstructive sleep apnea. So if, if your partner tells you that you lose, um, that you stop breathing in the middle of the night, well, that's a sign that you potentially have obstructive sleep apnea. And at that point, you would want to let your doctor know so you can get a sleep study. It's, obstructive sleep apnea has definitely gotten a lot more press over the years, and it's getting screened a lot more frequently. Socioeconomic status can also, you know, this can lead to issues with access to basic living necessities, medications, health care, and so on. So what is the prevalence of high blood pressure in the SEI population? And it's, it varies and it can range from 14% to 61%, but we know it is, it is common. Factors that affect the prevalence are gonna be age, gender, ethnicity, nationality, and neurological level of injury. And so prevalence of high blood pressure typically in, is lower in people with tetraplegia as compared to paraplegia, and a lot of that is due to what's happening with the neuroanatomy at the level of the injury. So typically individuals who are from T7 and below would typically be at higher risk of having high blood pressure versus someone who had a higher injury. And why again, why are we concerned with high blood pressure? And so high blood pressure again can lead to stroke, it can lead to heart failure, heart attacks, kidney disease, vision issues, and sexual dysfunction. So what are additional risks that are in individuals with an SCI? Some unique risks that affect individual SEI are physical deconditioning, nutrition, and again, the inflammation. So physical deconditioning, think about um, decreased strength, decreased stamina, and decreased capacity to perform physical activity. And I have this diagram here, the cycle of deconditioning. And we look at an individual who has a spinal cord injury eventually, which can lead to muscle paralysis, they're less able to exercise, performing less physical activity, ultimately lower fitness and less mobile, causes changes in the body, which I'm gonna talk about in more detail later, but changes in causing more fat and less muscle, increasing the risk of heart disease and health problems, further decreasing in mobility and function, leading to deconditioning, and it just becomes this repetitive cycle over the years. And if you think, you know, going back to that question that we were asked, what's the difference between someone getting injured in their 60s versus getting injured in their 20s? You imagine all the years that the person's kind of just stuck in this cycle and the damage that it's doing to the body. And so those changes that I was mentioning earlier, so there's changes in skeletal muscle structure, which we call atrophy. Basically, the muscle kind of just shrinks up and, and becomes a lot smaller or eventually dies off. And then there's also... Which, which in itself leads to decreased muscle strength, and then those muscle that is left is fatigued very easily. You have decreased cardiovascular function. There's, you know, depending on the level where the injury is at, the nerves that provide support to the heart in itself are affected, and also to blood vessels. It leads to also, in addition to compromising pulmonary function, due to weakness and stiffness of the respiratory muscles themselves. So in, in regarding nutrition, I wanted to talk about energy expenditure in individuals in a spinal cord injury. And so energy expenditure is just referring to how much energy do we produce in our body. And there's three things that we're gonna talk about. 
And the first one is basal metabolic rate. All of us right now, well, I'm up here talking and people are sitting down and those of you at home who are watching, just at rest, your body is burning so many calories. And, and we call that the basal metabolic rate. And that's really just the energy that you need in order to be alive. And that's the energy that's being used by your brain, that's being used by your kidneys, your liver, your heart, and your muscles. Then we think about physical activity. And physical activity in itself is just me up here talking right now. I'm bur just the fact that I'm talking and I'm a little nervous, so I'm sweating a little bit. Um, that's my body producing that kind of energy. But there's also then you add on top the physical activity from doing exercise in itself. And then lastly, we think of digestion. When your body digests food, it's also producing, um, it's producing energy. And so the majority of when we look at our total amount of energy, the majority of it's coming from our basal metabolic rate, and then physical activity, and then lastly, from digestion. So right now, for those of you um, who are at home, it's past dinner time, so likely you might have eaten dinner. This part of the curve right here, the yellow part, is probably will be a little bit higher than, say, me, who's not eating right now. And so that's just kind of the components I wanted you to think about. And that becomes important because we find that after a person has a spinal cord injury, that total amount of energy that you just burn decreases. And there's different reasons why it decreases. So we talked about when you have a spinal cord injury, you get muscle paralysis and you lose muscle mass. So now you have less muscles that are burning energy. So in effect, that basal metabolic rate is just gonna decrease. And then when you think about physical activity, well one is it becomes more difficult to do, act, you know, like say active exercising. So that in itself will decrease the physical activity um, part but also depending on the level of your injury, also like with breathing may be significantly impaired. So those are all factors that are gonna play an effect of why you would also get a decrease in physical activity following a spinal cord injury. And in this diagram, I mean, what we really know is when we think about gaining weight and losing weight, it's all a balance. So you're gonna say you take in 2,000 calories you eat. If, you, if your body burns um, 2,000 calories, you're gonna be in the bottom of this curve right here. And it's really unlikely that any of us really do that. And so that would be like a perfectly balanced state. But when you have a situation here where you're, say, eating more calories or taking in a lot of calories versus how many you're burning, well, you're going to end up with weight gain. And, this, and the way that you lose weight is by taking in less calories than what you're actually producing. But remember the kind of the problem that I had mentioned, what happens after SEI. Your basal metabolic rate and physical activity like rate automatically in itself decreases. So you kind of get already naturally get put in this state right here where you're gonna be more prone of gaining weight because your body itself is naturally just not producing as, um, is not producing as much energy at baseline. And these were just some the energy, estimated energy requirements. I think the take home message here is that, it, that an individual with a tetraplegia and it's, uh, uh, requires less calories versus an individual, individual with a paraplegia in, in comparison to um, the regular population. And I had mentioned this earlier regarding um, elevated inflammatory proteins. Just to make the point again, I don't want to get too caught up in too many of the details, but we do know that there's this one specific inflammatory protein called C-reactive protein is elevated in people with um, SEIs. And it's known in the population of individuals who don't have a spinal cord injury, we do know that having a high level of CRP is associated with having cardiovascular disease. But specifically, that relationship in spinal cord injury typically has, um, it still needs a lot more research. So that's why you wouldn't find it as something like simple, like where you go to your doctor and they order a lipid panel and they tell you based off of your cholesterol levels, what's your cardiovascular risk. It's not, it's not that straightforward right now to do that with the C-reactive protein. So how do we go ahead and diagnose these um, conditions? And so we'll first look at obesity. And there's really two ways we can measure obesity. We can look at BMI, which is the body mass index, and probably the most common way that you're familiar with. And there's also body composition. And so we'll look at body composition first. And so there's really four components um, to our body. We look at fat, muscle, bone, and water. Following a, um, a spinal cord injury, we see that there's a loss of muscle tissue, which is called sarcopenia. There's a loss of bone, which is called osteopenia. 
And then overall, you have decreased loss of water. And that's really because you're losing muscle. Muscle itself contains water. And I guess what I could have added here, what ultimately happens is you end up having increased fat. So you're going to lose muscle, you'll lose bone, you lose water, but then ultimately you end up increasing the amount of fat in the body. So how do you measure body composition? And I just put this on here just to tell you that there's all types of ways that you can do it. There's these things called like skin calipers, literally where you would um, pinch fat on different parts of your body, and that will correlate with a percentage. And you can get fancy techniques where you can put someone like in water. You can use like an x-ray machine to try to measure it. But in reality, these are not things that we're going to be doing in clinic. Like clinically, this is not as relevant. So really what we do is we're going to look at um, BMI to classify obesity. And that's typically why when you go to the doctor, you'll get weighed. And based off of your weight and based off of your height, we can come up with a value. And so in non-spinal cord injury population, when you have a BMI greater than 30, we would consider that obesity. But remember what I mentioned earlier. You're losing muscle, you're losing bone, and you're losing water. And as a result of that, that 30 value, we can't really, we can't use that because it wouldn't be comparative. So instead, in, in an SCI population, the value that we use is actually greater than 22. And so that's something that when you go for your annual exams with your physician, that's the, kind of the, the, the number that you want to look at, see what your BMI is compared to this 22 number. So if it's greater than 22, then that would be concerning for being obese. Following a spinal cord injury, you would get weighed in the rehab unit. And then I know at the VA what we do when we do our annual exams, we check a weight um, at each um, appointment. So having high blood sugar, known as um, hyperglycemia, these guidelines are from the American Diabetic Association. And you're probably already familiar with that when you go to the doctor, you can do a fasting plasma glucose level, which is basically you don't eat anything in the morning, and then see what's your blood sugar level like without any food in your system in the morning. And if that value is greater than 126, then it's concerned that you have diabetes. If it's between 100 and 125, it's concerned that you have prediabetes. The other value that's probably a little bit more accurate to look at is your A1C. And if your A1C is between 5.7 and 6.4, there's concern for prediabetes. And if it's greater than or equal to 6.5, then we're concerned for having diabetes. And in regards to high blood pressure, this is from the American Heart Association. So things start to become really concerning once you start getting systolic blood pressure of greater than, um, than 130. One thing to keep in mind, though, is individuals with higher spinal cord injuries typically will end up having lower blood pressures compared to um, individuals who have a lower level injury and are paraplegic. So according to the consortium guidelines, so the question is, does that change kind of our guidelines here? Um, um, and the, the, the consortium has taken, uh, is using the ADA um, guidelines, excuse me, the American Heart Association blood pressure guidelines. So the, the question was, what if someone has a, who has a, a high spinal cord injury, who typically has a lower blood pressure, would they still be, we would still be using these same guidelines. But it is important, though, I would make sure that I always advise my patients to measure their blood pressure on a daily basis, um, if you can. And then record that in a journal, and then show it to, um, show it to your doctor. Because if, say, for example, your systolic blood pressure is normally running at 100, well, if all of a sudden it starts staying elevated at, um, at a much higher number than your baseline, then that could be something concerning. So that would be something then you would want to talk to your um, physician about. So factors that can impact blood pressure recordings can be autonomic dysreflexia, orthostatic hypotension, kind of going to your point about your question is that some individuals, when they um, sit upright, their blood vessels don't constrict as well anymore because of the spinal cord injury. So you kind of get less blood pressure going to, the, to your upper extremities and can falsely show that you might have a lower blood pressure than you actually do. So that's why it's important when you do measure blood pressure to take multiple reads and do it at different times throughout the day. Regarding high cholesterol, this is again, we're talking about dyslipidemia. And remember the, the ratio that I had talked about. It's really we're looking at low good cholesterol and high triglycerides or high fats. And typically when you, get, when you go to your doctor and you get a lipid panel done, 
you'll see a TG, which is triglycerides, which is referring to fats. And typically, if it's above 150, we would consider that elevated. Your HDL, we typically like it above 40. So if it's less than 40 for men or less than 50 for women, that's concerning. And I will say that when we think about triglycerides, a common thing that really causes those levels to be high is really your diet. And so if you're eating a diet that's high in fat, well, then your, the amount of fat in your blood is going to be elevated. Also, um, alcohol has a tendency of causing a high level of fat in your blood. Regarding HDL, one of the things that's been shown to cause your HDL to elevate, and so remember, HDL is the good cholesterol, so we want that value to actually be higher, is exercise. And so unfortunately, having a spinal cord injury, you're having less um, physical activity, so it's harder for an individual then to get that benefit of exercise to increase the HDL, which I believe is why you typically will find the good cholesterol being low in um, individuals with a spinal cord injury. And it's just been known that when you have fat in your, in your blood levels um, greater than 150, it's shown that you're at an increased risk of developing, um, of having insulin resistance and ultimately developing diabetes. And when you have levels greater than 200, that's been shown to be at increased risk of having cardiovascular disease. And so overall, there's been, there is a strong association between having low good cholesterol and high fats and type 2 diabetes, being overweight, physical inactivity, um, smoking cigarettes, having high carbohydrate intake, and uh, some other genetic factors. You know, as I mentioned earlier, persons with SCI typically have low good cholesterol and then high triglycerides. So I talked about all those different components of CMD. So technically, according to the American Heart Association, well then, how can you be diagnosed with it? And so we talked about there's all those components of having high blood sugar, the insulin resistance, the abnormal um, cholesterol and fat levels, and um, being obese and having high blood pressure. So according to the American Heart Association guidelines, they say that having three or more of the following. So BMI greater than 22, that's how we define what obesity is. Having plasma fat levels or triglycerides greater than 150 having good cholesterol levels lower than 40 or 50 in a man or woman respectively, or having elevated blood pressure, or having elevated fasting glucose greater than 100. So what can we talk about for regarding management? And so in management of CMD, we can look at um, primary management and secondary management. And under primary management, we're gonna look at what are lifestyle interventions that we can do, specifically regarding nutrition and exercise. And then secondary management comes in regards to like medications that we can use to treat these conditions. So overall with nutrition, a lot of it just kind of general guidelines in regards to trying to increase the amount of fruits and vegetables you eat, try to eat less saturated fats, and try to decrease the amount of refined carbohydrates that you eat. And the guidelines themselves don't endorse a specific diet, but they have reported benefits that so there's the DASH nutritional plan, which I'll get into in the next slide, which was shown to help treat um, hypertension, and then also adopting like a med Mediterranean nutritional um, diet. And so overall, they recommend no more than 5 to 6% of saturated fat, keeping sodium under 2,400 milligrams to prevent hypertension. And regarding protein intake, it's really similar to the population of individuals without a spinal cord injury. It's just that likely that if you do have like a wound, for example, you would require um, to take in more protein to help the wound heal. And so this is a link. Um, this is the DASH eating plan. It's provided by the NIH, the National Institute of Health. And I put a link in the PowerPoint that can connect you to the diet to have an idea of what the diet entails. And really the goal of this diet was to show that you can reduce hypertension by adapting it. And this is a link to the USDA website. It describes like eating patterns in individuals who take up a Mediterranean style diet. So I provided that link on there also if you're interested in seeing what the, that diet entails. The Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, they have like a list that I provided here regarding just some eat right nutritional tips, which I think a lot of people you're already familiar with but I found this list to be helpful. So it's in the PowerPoint, but I also have the link available for you to go to so you can download your own if you would like. And then regarding the exercise, 
and the recommendations for exercise is really to try to have routine exercise um, if possible, and it's been shown to decrease your risk of developing CMD. Uh, the guidelines recommend participating in at least 150 minutes per week of physical exercise, so 30 to 60 minutes performed three to five days per week, or by exercising for at least three 10 minute sessions per day. If you're unable to tolerate the above physical activity level, individuals should engage in regular physical activity according to their ability. So really, you just be mindful. You're, I always find that your body's gonna let you know if you're doing something that's hurting it. But in the case of a spinal cord injury, it may, may not be that easy, so I'd recommend before working out, check your blood pressure, make sure your blood you feel comfortable with your blood pressure, and you can check it afterwards, that might help you. And I just put this study in here to show that this was a study done having one group of individuals do hand cycling. In a control group, they didn't do any hand cycling. And after six weeks, it was shown that the group that exercised was able to um, decrease their BMI. They decreased their fasting um, insulin levels. So by decreasing fasting insulin levels, what that's telling you is that ultimately that's correlating with having lower blood sugar levels. And that was just only from doing that for six weeks. So I thought that was pretty impressive. So the, the question was, you know, are there any specific um, exercises that we can do? Um, I, I didn't include any specific exercises um, in this point because in this PowerPoint because I feel like that can be a whole nother um, lecture. Um, but I, I would recommend if you haven't already to get connected with a physical therapist um, who's, who works with individuals with spinal cord injury. And even right now, like we're doing a lot of um, telehealth where our therapists are providing individuals with, um, with exercises that they can do at home. But also when, and it's difficult to do this now, but uh, once uh, with, due to the, the social distancing that we're doing, but it's also been shown that doing like e-stim exercises with a therapist by stimulating, um, by stimulating the muscles in paralyzed limbs, that also in itself is effective. And regarding pharmacology, um, this in itself can be like a really long talk, but I wanted to keep it straightforward and I wanted to put in here some common medications um, that you may already be familiar with. So these are again our components of CMD. And so regarding obesity, there's no me uh, medication that I recommended. Really the most effective thing to really help there is going to be good nutrition. In regards to insulin resistance and diabetes, typically first line medication people will take is metformin. And then there's a multitude of different medications that um, you can take, which will be determined by your primary care physician. But we typically would start individuals with metformin. And regarding um, abnormal um, cholesterol levels, typically the first medication we start with is called a statin therapy. And that's literally because in, when you look at the actual pharmacological name, all these medicines, there, there's a bunch of them all have this word statin inside of them. So a common one that people use is a torvastatin, also known as Lipitor. And in regarding high blood pressure, again, there's multiple medications you can take. Typically, people will start off with something like, like a thiazide. Uh, you can use Lasix, also known as furosemide, amlodipine, lisinopril, and so um, lasartan. So all these medications, though, what we try to do is take advantage of one medicine that can actually take care of multiple things. And so, for example, lisinopril, an ACE inhibitor, is also known to help people who have diabetes protect their kidneys. And it's also known in individuals who have heart issues to be protective of the heart. So you might find yourself that if you do have prediabetes or diabetes and you're hypertensive, your physician might want to put you on that medication, for example. The big point I, the big point I want to um, caution you on here is that there's typically, uh, you know, our patients with spinal cord injury are on multiple medications. And those medications can interact negatively with your blood pressure meds. And some of the medications commonly taken for neurogenic bladder or sexual dysfunction, like Viagra, for example, that can affect your blood pressure also, medicines that you take for spasticity and for pain. So one thing I always recommend for my patients is to keep a list of your medications with you if possible. So if you can keep a list of your meds with you, and even if your partner's list, if you both have lists, you can carry each other's list just in case if you end up going to the hospital, depending on what hospital you go to, they may not necessarily have those medications in the medical record. And so that's just a common thing that I highly advise doing, especially because potentially a lot of these medications can have negative side effects with each other. And that is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick.
any questions uh, from the audience that we haven't covered already? I tried to capture the ones that I saw in the chat. Okay, one more question. Who would be the best provider to start down the road of examinees th examining these things and treating them? Do you, do you recommend that people just start with their primary care provider, or do you recommend that you go to a spinal cord injury specialist? There are unique um, implications that your spinal cord injury has on your body. And typically, um, people who, who have more insight into that are someone who, like myself, um, gets fellowship trained. Um, so that's why I'd recommend that you at least establish care with one and see on an annual basis. So for example, one of the things that we do on an annual exam is we would check um, you know, your lipid panel, we would check your uh, A1C to rule out diabetes, we would check your thyroid level to make sure that you don't have any thyroid problems. And that's because those organs can all get affected from the spinal cord injury. But also we will look at um, your kidneys and because your kidneys are at risk of getting injured due to the spinal cord injury. And these injuries, um, and it's not something that necessarily happens right away, that can happen later in your life. So that's why it's important to at least establish care with a spinal cord injury uh, physician um, at least once a year if possible to um, do that additional testing. Yeah, and there's, I mean, you're really fortunate being out here because there's a lot of great um, spinal cord um, injury uh, physicians that are available in Washington. Next question, is uh, BMI impacted by weak abdominal muscles? Does it have any relationship to that weakness that happens? Yeah, so that's a great, um, so the question was, does, um, does, is BMI related to having a weak abdominal muscles? So, and um, part of the, gui when, the when the guidelines were um, put together in regards to, um, to how to identify what obesity is, what we, um, in, in non-SEI um, patients, they actually look at abdominal girth. Um, and that, and there's, there's a certain, um, I don't remember the exact level, but there's so many, uh, there's at a point when you're above a certain number of inches, they would classify that as obese. But in the case of someone with a spinal cord injury, can't do that because of the weak abdominal muscles causes the girth to be a little bit more, um, uh, um, you know, causes the girth to increase. So when, when BMI is calculated, it's actually calculated based off of your weight and your height. It doesn't take into account your uh, abdominal growth. So that's a great question. All right, any last questions? If not, thank you all for joining us tonight and uh, join me in uh, a small round of applause for Dr. Dubai. <laughs>